the dean of our new division of fine and applied arts. And he's going to visit with you. Interestingly enough, today the paper made one mistake. It said he was going to talk with you about keeping the peace. And I, I read that and I thought, now that's an interesting assignment for a new dean. <laughs> and I wondered uh, with whom it was he was going to keep the peace. But Bob is pretty good at this. So, uh, But the topic of the speech isn't keeping the peace. It's, it's keeping the pace. Uh, Bob is good at that too. Where are you, Bob? President Mrs. Emmons, Mr. and Mrs. Bracken, Miss Mish, Dr. Jeep. May I stop there with names because I've seen in the audience a number of people who I should like to name as well as those here, including Mr. and Mrs. Halleck and Williams and just a whole group. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope I can keep the peace. I'd even settle right now for a little pace. Did you ever know anyone to willingly walk into a situation where he had so many bosses present, <laughs> where what he says could be disastrous. You know, it worried me at length for a period of time, but taking the lessons of some of my bosses, I said there must be a way of sharing this kind of worry, and I found it, and it was this. I thought, gee, if I'm worried, about what I'm going to say. I wonder how they feel. <laughs> and with that, you know, the thing quiets down. You have a certain amount of peace, and so you go about setting the pace. I think it's at this point that I should say it's my pleasure to be here, but I think it would be a bit more proper at this moment to say it is my honor to be here, for I do indeed feel honored to have been invited to report to you. And yet it is also a pleasure to be a part of a dynamic institution such as this is and to be privileged to speak about that in which one believes so thoroughly and respects so highly. And I should like to pay some special tribute to the classes represented here tonight. There's just a little something extra about each one. Margaret Studebaker came around this week and she says, Bob, treat us kindly. Now, Ora Davis, I don't think knows me, but I know Ora Davis. I was kind of brought up on him at home. And then there's Ralph Cross, hosting the class of 33. And Ralph sets the pace around here in the Muncie community for about everything. We continue to follow him. Then there was Dick Cady in 38, and I understand Dick isn't here tonight. But let me tell you, I spent the first two years at Ball State envying Dick Cady. He had just about everything. And then there was a class of 43, Warren Jones clips out a clipping about the program and mails it to him and he says, what can we expect next? And I told him, don't ask me in advance, you, you know what's coming, if you come, this is your responsibility. He came, Charles Hassel, the class of 53, and then a lot of youngsters that... Uh, well, our present graduates that we're honoring tonight, well, they speak for themselves. I think they did as they stood a while ago. Now, I, I want to indicate to you now that there's perhaps somewhat more of an obligation on my part to report to this class of 43 than any other one. And I want to tell you a little bit about why. I suppose I never felt gayer than when President Pittenger called me one morning you see, I was a senior when you people came, and invited me to share the platform with him on the opening convocation welcoming the class of 43 to Ball State. Well, this was one landmark. It was also my job to scan that class pretty carefully and pick out the right fraternity pledges that year. Managed to get some pretty good people out of that group. It also happened to be in that class that I found my wife, and there's a wee bit of obligation there and a little care, incidentally. Well, in other words, as I looked this situation over, I thought, you know, this could be a chance to pick up a little vacation money for the facts that I happen to possess about a number of these people. Well, you know how it is. 
Well, I made an inquiry or two to see just how far one could go with this. Ray Ashley says, but Bob, remember, we had to have a change of president here before you could even come back. <laughs> well, very soon I found this was no time for lucrative intent. In fact, I rushed over to the alumni office, made a contribution, defensive contribution, if you please, and vowed right then to stick with the honorable tonight. Well, this matter of keeping the pace, what does it mean? If you should gather a certain connotation of being on the run, then we have at least a partial meeting of the minds. Or should your interpretation embody certain comparisons with other colleges and universities, we aren't entirely apart. Or should we enter this realm of being, shall we say, on the beam? We're thinking, but the problem really isn't quite as simple as to fit in any one of those categories. The fact is, we must be on the run to even stay current. And comparisons with other institutions may help on some occasions, but we're all different in our purposes. We're all different in the things that we do. And so this doesn't quite measure up. But let me simply say we believe we are doing a number of things well, that we are indeed setting the pace in some instances, but you are wrong if you think I should stand before my many bosses, a wonderful group of personal friends and alumni, and enumerate any significant number of my own or our own inadequacies. You know, confidence has been described as that feeling one has before he knows all the facts. And so it's with considerable confidence that I approach the subject this evening. Let's begin, first of all, in terms of the growth we have experienced. And surely here we are setting the pace. There is every reason to believe that we shall have more than 9,000 students on the campus next September, and our predictions for September of, of 1964 call for 10,274. We have our predictions extended on through, where well, some of our staff could tell you when we will have 15,000, when we will have 17,000. Of course, that's provided lots of things. And yet the bodies are here, the children are born, the graduates are on their way. And so this seems to be a rather reasonable uh, assumption. And I should say to you that proportionately, this is the greatest growth of any institution in the state of Indiana, proportionately. Certainly here we are setting the pace. Now you've heard the reasons for our growth before and I shall not elaborate on them now. And then I should hasten to point out that we cannot and do not take pride in mere number. If we are to be proud of our size, it shall have to be pride to the extent that we can find ourselves able to be of real assistance to this increased number of people and for our particular geographic area in which we serve. This size brings us both opportunities and problems. Yes, we've lost some of the things that you and I valued, but incidentally, I want to say to you, that all this talk about air conditioning wasn't completely out in those days back when. If you remember the old pine shelf was air conditioned, and so was the tally hole, and that was the best reason we had for getting rid of them. We've had to lose, I suppose, some of our contact with students, some of our being able to call everybody we meet by name, but we have been able, as a result of our growth, to add faculty and facilities and programs and opportunities that just couldn't be with us at the previous stage. And so in this way, we simply try to capitalize upon the advantage and eliminate as much as possible the losses that, seldom, that so, uh, sometimes do occur as a result of change. But let's look on at still some other things. You know, it's the constant study of our purposes that is so imperative. And it's the result of these studies that determine our direction. And here I suspect we would find ourselves 
either setting the pace, keeping the pace, or losing the ball. Let's have a look at those purposes as interpreted to some extent at least now. Institutionally, we are certainly dedicated to the education of teachers. And in this we take real pride, may we always. About 80% of our students each year seek certification as teachers. You are also aware that we enjoy much company in teacher education in the state of Indiana with some 30 other institutions of higher, uh, 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 higher learning engaged in the same process. And so we are not just the teacher education institution in the state of Indiana. Perhaps you are also aware that our students come from throughout the United States and from many foreign countries, but that a substantial majority of our students do come from this particular geographic area. Thus we find ourselves in need of a truly multi-purpose institution if we are to begin to serve the needs, the interests, the aptitudes of the students coming to us. For many years, we have recognized this objective of multiplicity, and today we have an enrollment in curricular programs other than teaching, which are equal to our pre-war total enrollment, and currently larger than the total enrollments in many private colleges in the state of Indiana. About 20% of our enrollment is entered in these programs, and that will permit you to keep uh, some idea of how many we will have as our enrollment increases, if, if no change in that takes place. But what are these programs? Well, in our pre-professional programs, we have medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, law, engineering, the ministry. We have programs for social workers, for dietitians, for boys club personnel, for medical technology, for the arts and sciences, and our largest one is in business administration. In addition, we have two-year programs in general arts and in secretarial training. We have under study at the present time, we hope about ready for approval, a two-year plus program in graphic arts we have already approved a new nursing education program, which will begin in September of 1964. These are the kinds of things we are doing in the ways of, of curricular programs. Another way of describing our offerings would be to say we have less than degree programs, that's our two-year programs. We have bachelor degree programs, master's degree programs, joint doctorate programs, our own doctoral program, short courses and workshops galore. In short, an offering of breadth and depth, both general and specific, more encompassing, if you please, than those of numerous highly reputable universities. Yet by no stretch of the imagination are we attempting to provide all the offerings we might or that even are requested. Rather, we are trying very hard not to become all things to all people, but to develop only those programs for which there is a real need and for which we can serve well. Other educational problems immediately ahead, just one of which I want to mention specifically. It's a, pro it's a problem for the entire state of Indiana. And that's the matter of how and who shall provide the technical education so badly needed in the state of Indiana. In, unemployment is now of major concern, both locally and nationally. Unemployment at a time when there are many good jobs available, but lacking personnel properly prepared to fill them. The labor force as a whole, we know, will increase by 20% during the decade of the 60s. But occupational groups, which include professional, semi-professional, and technical workers, will have to increase at least 40% in that same period of time to meet job demands of an increasingly complex society. Our question shall be who, where, and when 
will this be provided for certainly it must come or our unemployment picture will simply multiply in the years that lie immediately ahead. Well, let's move along. As President Emmons has pointed out, we are also keeping the pace in terms of cost. And this isn't something we're bragging about, but he indicated to you that we didn't get quite the whole loaf. And to keep the quality programs that we must have, we found again that it's necessary to increase the cost of college. Now, this is of great concern to us. It is of concern to people, I'm sure, throughout the nation. Charles Carroll, North Carolina State Superintendent of Education, in testimony before the state legislature in 1961 said, every generation must decide whether it shall levy upon itself taxes to pay for the education of the boy or for the ignorance of the man. A rather substantial statement, it seems to me. Surely it is true that we are not approaching the time of providing free higher education, but it's a real crucial point that we decide at what point the person must pay for it and that society must help to underwrite it. This is not our problem alone to solve at the college, but it is our problem as members of the social order if we are indeed to keep higher education available to all persons of ability, regardless of their economic background. But that we must leave for a solution at still other times. I think there's no doubt that in measuring the values on a college campus, we would all be inclined to say our first values are placed upon our students. But I think our next values would be on our instructional and operational staff. And I feel we're doing a, a fine job at this point in maintaining a highly efficient and effective professional staff here at Ball State Teachers College. This is a difficult job these days. The stories you read are true. Finding qualified people in the variety of fields with a level of training is indeed a real challenge, a real responsibility. The last official figures I saw, and I didn't go to the president's office just before this, revealed that we had some 58% of our instructional staff with doctoral degrees. This compares very favorably with institutions throughout the country. It is, I was surprised to learn, much more favorable than in some of the older, longer established colleges. We're finding that our staff today is not only teaching more, but it is writing more, it is researching more than we have been able to do in certain past periods. I did not say we were a more able staff than those in the past, for I, being of the old school, cannot bring myself to believe that we shall ever surpass the abilities of the staff which has so well established this institution. But in adding to our size, we have been given the opportunity to employ more specialists, and in a period when more highly specialized staff members become essential. Now, we are operating today in a period in history when, according to Dr. Oppenheimer, our store of knowledge is increasing at the rate, or is doubling, in every eight and a half to ten years. Now, you don't need to testify as to what this means, but look back, people at the time you had your college education and think how much there more there is to know today than there was then. I'm not going to calculate it for myself. But this represents a terrific problem. We can no longer prepare people through a college degree or through a series of degrees that will then say, you go out, you are prepared. You're prepared for a few months, maybe. But new developments are occurring daily, and our staff is finding it a real challenge to stay current in their fields. People who graduated in the field of physics 10 years ago, had they not done anything in the meantime, would know almost nothing about what they teach today. The basic principles, oh yes, this is important, but the developments in science, well, we are told that 93% of the important living scientists are, are, are the important scientists of all ages are living today. 
This represents then a challenge to us in helping ourselves to stay current. We have long been known for teaching just slightly more than is found ordinarily on a campus, and we are actively seeking today to reduce those loads so that faculty may have a better opportunity to keep themselves prepared. But let me tell you, in this period, when much talk is being heard about decreasing the work week, this reduction in load is in no way intended to reduce the length of the work week of the faculty. It's to merely change the occupation of time during that period. Let's talk a bit about our students. I went up to counseling and said, what kind of students are we getting today? And they say, good ones. Well, I know that. How good? Well, they say we're getting from the upper 50% of the high school graduating classes, 66 and two-thirds percent of our enrollment. Good selection. When we don't select for admission, we select through retention. Yet you see the selection process has taken place already when they come to us. No doubt you have heard reports that college work is more difficult now than was true a few years ago. Now this I would not deny, but at no time have we purposely attempted to make the work more difficult in order to eliminate students. Our rate of disqualification continues rather constant. Our work has been upgraded, and this has been a rather natural phenomenon resulting from a variety of pressures from the total social order. It's happening in everything. The same thing is happening to a large number of our high schools. Students are coming to us better prepared today than they were only a short time ago. They are coming with higher motivation and with greater purpose. High academic achievement at both the high school level and the college level enjoys a much greater respect than it did only a few short years ago. People don't duck anymore to be called egghead. We hold special programs on many occasions on this campus each year to honor excellence in achievement. Value is placed upon it. Appreciation exists. We have a greater number of opportunities for careers for these young people than we've had before. The requests for them, the opportunities they may entertain, are really tremendous. We do not have to worry about unemployment of the people finishing our programs, and this is true of any institution. These people are prepared for the world of work ahead. Our placement office has expanded considerably and is under leadership which gladly adopts the, philo the philosophy of greater assistance and greater expansion and greater service. We are attempting to recognize the preparation which students bring to us by making possible credit examinations in certain of our courses and by providing for exemptions from some of the basic elementary courses from which students may have already achieved adequate competency. And this must move ahead. We're having, this is a, a very current thing that is happening now and it must be expanded. For it's amazing what some of the people are able to bring to us and we certainly want to be in a position of saying, if you are a bright student, come to us. We have a program that will be of value to you. We can recognize your preparation. Generally, I included nothing in my remarks about buildings except I thought I should report to you people uh, about our residence halls. We believe we are keeping the, play, the pace in residence halls. Some of our publics even claim we may be out ahead. I'd point out that we already have in operation our first co-ed residence hall and a second under construction. And now I ask you how much more considerate could you be? You remember those long treks back from Lucina to Elliott or from Lucina to Pete's or from Forest Hall to you know where. Well, this isn't necessary anymore. But uh, let me assure you, however, that conservatism hasn't completely expired, for this building was designed in wings, man's wing there, girl's wing here, uh, two wings make an angel, I think. But I would point out, too, that 
Not taking any risk, this was the first residence hall in which we installed some air conditioning. Not in the rooms, but in this part where the students share together. I thought you alumni should know that. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's quite a step forward, and believe me, it's working very well. We're very happy with it. Uh, Jack Farrell tells me he, he hardly gets calls at night anymore since this, this happens. No trouble getting in. You're already in. It's only the wing that causes trouble. <laughs> well, other examples of keeping the pace. A number of these points I should just like to mention in passing. There are people here tonight or on the campus tonight who would be delighted to have the opportunity to give you a complete talk about them. They're exciting things. They're important things. And I shall just handle them in passing. I hope most of you have heard about the Burris Mathematics Program, authored and sponsored by, uh, written by the teachers from our Burris School and through our own mathematics department uh, assistance. This is gaining a fine a reputation. We have had a number of government contracts now for the guidance and biological science summer workshops. Tomorrow we will graduate the first group of students to have completed our honors program, a program designed to challenge particularly selected high ability students who choose to go on that program themselves. You know we have develop the joint doctoral programs with both Purdue and IU. And now we have our own students about to complete the first doctor's degrees to be earned strictly at Ball State Teachers College. During the past year, we have implemented a completely new teacher certification pattern in all departments in which the general education requirements have been increased in line with the general recommendations throughout the country. At the same time, Specialization has been continued to such an extent in the program that we have no conscience about saying our teachers in the special fields are well prepared in, for the fields in which they shall teach. We have had, over a period of years now, the science lecture series, which gains in prestige and momentum each year. We have had the science fair on our campus, bringing literally hundreds of students to our campus annually. The Indiana Conference on Foreign Language and Elementary Schools occupies the time of certain of our staff now as work goes ahead in that direction. Our FM station is back on the air, and we anticipate increased power in the near future. We have the studios built in for our television instruction. The orders are drawn up now for our cameras. This next year, we shall devote considerable time in preparing teachers to do instruction by television. We should be on the air, we hope, in the following year with well-planned educational programs. We have received special research grants in a number of fields. Dr. Tovat Burris is, is uh, beginning one now. Uh, well, Bob told me what to call it, and it's so hard to pronounce. I'm going to call it the Tovat Study in Composition. Uh, we have developed in the rather recent years a very fine Air Force ROTC program. And in visits I have made recently to air bases around the country, I'm impressed by the reputation that this particular unit holds. It is producing officers at a rate far in excess of most schools throughout the country. The new linguistic approach to the teaching of English has received real leadership here at Ball State. We have developed an accounting internship that is an outstanding program, and it is with the cooperation of six leading uh, public uh, accounting firms throughout the country. <coughs> a new art center is in the process of being developed at the present time through the courtesy of the Ball family and under the direction of the art department and Dr. Nichols. This is uh, to be in one of the Ball houses on Minatrista Boulevard. And the family has made this available to us so that we may develop a real community art center there. If you haven't attended any of our music uh, and drama productions in recent years, you're missing some very real opportunities. Operas are being produced. Concerts of very high quality are a regular practice on the campus at the present time. We have developed reading clinics and writing clinics for those students who come to us and find that they have basic weaknesses. These are not credit programs. 
they are provided simply to let the student help himself, and we think they are of considerable value. Perhaps our most recent accomplishment was our complete certification by the National Association for the Accreditment of Teacher Education, in which we received as full an accreditation as is available to us. Well, I mention those as saying these are illustrative of the programs that have developed, of the things that have happened, of how I would say we are keeping the pace in programs. Now let's turn to still another. And it has to do with leadership. John W. Gardner has written, the best kept secret in America today is that people would rather work hard for something they believe in than enjoy a pampered idleness. Now, I could not agree more on Mr. Gardner's point, and I believe it is characteristic of the philosophy on the campus. In fact, had I not read the quotation myself, I would have been inclined to attribute it to President Emmons. But this kind of drive, this kind of work, at the same time that you are encountering vast expansion and vast growth, creates certain problems related to communication, to understanding, and to the feeling of joint purpose. How do we advance together always in a forward direction? And it is here, I think, that leadership enters the picture very dramatically and dynamically. President Ammons reviewed with you a few minutes ago the fact that we now have our own State Teachers College Board, and it is the one that has written the many years of history for us. I should certainly agree that this has been a very real advantage to us. And I think the smooth operations that have characterized their work throughout the years, at least that I have been at Ball State, could only lead to congratulations to both the board and our president. Then let me state, without fanfare or bouquet, that we have been extremely fortunate in having the leadership of President and Mrs. Emmons since 1945 and throughout this period of a very tremendous growth. Many people have assisted him in his work, but through his leadership, we have seen developed what I believe to be a highly competent staff, an expanded curricular program, and greatly improved facilities as realities we live with today. The demands upon President Emmons for consultative work in other institutions in this country and those abroad are testimony of his recognition throughout the country. The needs for positive dynamic leadership only increase each year that we are in existence. I should give special recognition to the President's four major administrative heads, Dr. Baum, Dr. Wagoner, Dr. Byrell, and Dr. Burkhardt for the part they have had in assisting him with his program. And then there are the 14 department heads who carry a really tremendous load on this campus. But I always end up by having to say that the president, his administrative heads, his department heads, all are dependent for their success upon the cooperation and assistance of their complete instructional and operational staff. And so, you see, we find why it becomes so necessary to have both direction and leadership, faith and understanding, cooperation and willingness to fight ahead for that which we believe to be so important. John Mason Brown has said, existence is a strange bargain. Life owes us little. We owe it everything. The only true happiness comes from squandering ourselves for a purpose. Perhaps it may seem odd to think in terms of squandering ourselves in the future successes, but in the tone of John Mason Brown, what better could we do? It seems clear 
that in the long run our challenge is to our sense of purpose, our vitality, and the creativity of the members of our entire college community. Failing to meet this challenge, the stratagems of the moment shall be of little avail. I feel confident that the faculty, the staff, and the student body would join with me in pledging our squandering or giving, if you please, our vitality, our greatest effort toward the continued success of Ball State Teachers College. Our future is limited only by whatever limitations all of us collectively possess. Keeping the pace, well, I'm too prejudiced to answer whether we are or whether we aren't, I'd rather leave it on my, shall we say, prejudiced facts to let you draw your own conclusion. Thank you. Thank you.